Hi, you're watching Iniverse English. I found myself reborn in a fantasy realm, a place adorned with vaulted ceilings lit by candles instead of light bulbs, a world noticeably lagging behind Earth regarding civilization's development. It struck me as improbable for a homeless orphan who perished from overwork to be born into such opulence. Yet, it felt like a genuine stroke of luck. Before me lay a delightful sight, a charming, cooing baby, embarking on a journey to explore this new realm. But another reason for my fortune was that I was born into affluence. The child's mother, stunningly beautiful, gazed at her offspring with boundless love, promising a life of adoration and privilege. Three years later, I stood atop a wooden chair, my first conquest in a life of many. Peering out the window, I beheld the vast expanse of my new world. The sight mesmerized me, my wide-eyed wonder reflecting the enormity of the realm before me. Truly, it was something extraordinary. This expansive world, captivating not only the eyes of a child, but also his soul. A maid bursts into the room, her voice trembling with fear, Young master! The child's brief escapade is swiftly halted as the girl rushes to remove him from the precarious perch. It's far too dangerous to stand there, she admonishes, her concern palpable. Yet, at this moment, the mischievous child learns of his illustrious lineage. He is raised in the esteemed household of the Grand Duke, a figure renowned throughout the kingdom of Lionheart. At the tender age of eight, the young hero gazes at the gleaming ornate sword, sunlight dancing off its polished surface. Destined to become a knight of the realm, he eagerly begins his tutelage in the art of swordsmanship. His heart brims with genuine joy at the prospect. I can become a knight. Perhaps I'll master the use of the sacred sword. He muses with excitement. Assigned as his mentor is Sir Gothic, a holy knight appointed by the palace. It must be the will of the goddess. The man declares his tone resolute. I am honored to take on this role. A pleasure to meet you, Leon. He addresses the boy warmly. Yet, as Leon grows to fourteen, his elation turns to resentment. What is this? Curse you, Gothic. Curse you! He exclaims, his teeth clenched in fury. The Holy Knight, it seems, is no guardian angel but rather a tormentor cloaked in human guise, making it a daunting task for Leon to claim his rightful title. We witness the hero straining against a colossal boulder, his teacher nearby urging him to complete another circuit. These tasks are essential in his training, proving his worthiness as a knight of the kingdom. The final step involves obtaining recognition as the Holy Grail and drinking from the sacred waters. With a swift strike of his sword, Leon attempts to impress, yet Sir Gothic effortlessly parries his every move. Undeterred, Leon throws himself into the grueling training, clouds of earth swirling around him as he pushes his limits. Suddenly, Sir Gothic's left hand surges with an unknown energy, catching Leon off guard. Moreover, as the son of the Duke of Draconia, Leon must master all the skills necessary for a future Grand Duke. Keep your focus on your opponent until the end, Sir Gothic imparts, as Leon endures a painful blow, sending him reeling. Thus, the hero learns to fulfill the dual roles of Grand Duke's heir and Holy Knight, even as his cherished sword shatters. Lying on the ground, he gazes skyward, contemplating the existence of a higher power, though he adheres to no particular faith. At sixteen, we find a matured Leon, his footsteps echoing in rain-soaked puddles as he searches. It was somewhere around here, he mutters, raincoat shielding him from the downpour. His quest takes him far and wide, seeking recognition from the goddess to attain the status of holy knight. Just as he despairs, a plume of smoke rises from the trees, catching his attention. To gain recognition from the goddess, one must uphold a noble reputation and engage in virtuous acts. Smoke billows from a besieged military camp, cries for help mingling with warnings of impending orc attacks. Amidst the chaos, a belief persists. If one maintains a righteous path, the goddess will eventually reveal her presence. Yet, to some, such faith may seem absurd. Before the camp's gate, three warriors stand resolute, swords drawn in defense. Among them, 
Sir Gildas voices desperation, questioning if this is the end while invoking the goddess for protection. Meanwhile, the orcs advance with chilling confidence, their numbers seemingly overwhelming. Despite the odds, the hero's concern is not for the enemy's strength, but for the ample opportunities to wield his sword. In a bold move, Leon confronts the orcs, his words a challenge to their intrusion upon the kingdom's soil. One of the monsters hesitates at the audacity of the man before him, only to meet a swift and decisive blow from Leon's blade, blood staining the air. Indeed, the kingdom faces numerous adversaries. At twenty years old, Leon has matured further, encountering a being of ethereal beauty, a goddess. Wolfie Draconia, son of Leon Draconia, she addresses him, bestowing upon him a mission to prove his honor and faith. As he kneels before her, he acknowledges the divine presence, reaffirming his commitment to serve. I will do as you command, Ariana, he declares, recognizing the reality of the goddess's existence. After years of dedicated service, Leon ascended to the esteemed rank of Holy Knight, transforming into a refined figure clad in armor, wielding a formidable sword. His exploits included vanquishing orcs, routing goblins, and dismantling an insidious cult. Rising to the esteemed position of Pain Knight, he led fellow knights in decimating hordes of orcs, eradicating even their women and children. A necessary but burdensome task. At 35, the revered figure known as Saint Argent Leonard revered as both a living saint and a demigod, breathed his last. Adorned in regal attire, he lay upon a bed of flowers within an opulent coffin, his sword clasped tightly to his chest. His demise occurred in the throes of battle against an archdemon summoned by the Empire. If orcs had once posed a significant threat, demons now ran rampant, underscoring the imperative for humanity to uphold faith in the gods and pay homage to them. The hero strides ahead of the funeral procession, flanked by solemn monks bearing the weight of the coffin on their shoulders. Curse the magicians of the empire, hisses Leon, his visage etched with determination. Amidst the turmoil following King Lionheart's honorable demise, the kingdom faced the crucial task of selecting a new holy knight and heir to the throne. Amid this chaos, the goddess descended, singling out Leon for this sacred duty. Within a grand hall, witnessed by rows of prostrated servants, the goddess hovers, bestowing her blessing upon Leon. Sacred Knight Leon Draconia, she declares, my loyal champion, embody honor and faith. Yes, Ariana, Leon affirms, bowing humbly. The honor bestowed upon him was great, but it demanded diligent stewardship. With unwavering resolve, Leon pledges to safeguard the kingdom and its sacred treasures, including the revered Lion Heart. As an elegant crown settles upon his brow, he ascends to the titles of Grand Duke of Draconia and King of Lion Heart. Thus, before us stands the monarch in all his regal splendor, adorned with the trappings befitting his station. At 80 years old, Leon has witnessed a plethora of extraordinary events. He steered the kingdom through three devastating wars with the orcs and beheld the astonishing transformation of a lowly goblin into a fearsome archdemon. The relentless harassment from the abominable empire persists. Your Majesty, a knight in armor addresses Leon from behind. The imperial school of dark magicians is once again engaging in perilous experiments. Their allegiance to the teachings of the blasphemous northern cult is the root cause Leon fumes, his disdain evident. How dare they reject the divine? Utter fools. He commands the knights to assemble, attributing the turmoil to the folly of granting human rights to those unworthy even of servitude. We must prevail, he asserts with resolve. At 96, the empire's machinations reach a devastating climax. A shattered statue's head stands as a grim testament, accompanied by incomprehensible utterances. We offer three million lives, grant our plea, screams a deranged figure, invoking madness. The emperor's transgressions reach a tipping point. The despicable tyrant, refusing to face justice, commits suicide, coercing three million residents of the capital to follow suit. A sprawling square bears witness to the carnage, strewn with countless corpses, as the lord of chaos manifests in the city. 
In response, King Leon rallies his knights, brandishing the sacred sword, still stained with the blood of orc massacres from the previous year. To the empire, we march, he declares, striding towards the towering gates of the temple, his warriors marching steadfastly behind him. At 121 years old, Leon's valiant efforts to preserve the world have fallen short, witnessing its destruction against his fervent desires. Clutching a ragged doll salvaged from the flames, he mourns his inability to vanquish all evil, despite the continent's collective sanctity. Kneeling amidst a sea of lifeless bodies, Leon is interrupted by a voice from behind. Sir Orin, he acknowledges, take pride. Your father met an honorable end and joins the Feast of the Gods. The young warrior nods solemnly, understanding the weight of Leon's words. With a heavy heart, Leon orders his troops to maintain vigilance, harboring little hope for a favorable outcome. Ah, goddess, he muses bitterly, your faithful tremble in fear. As Leon's army prepares for battle, flanked by two fellow commanders, he addresses the assembled knights with an impassioned plea. Do you hear the cries of those who defy us? He demands. They are the ones who have taken our kin. Do you hear the creatures that have torn our loved ones from us? Do you hear those who seek to desecrate all we hold dear? His words resonate with the anguish of women soothing their infants and the determination of youth clinging to flickering hope amidst the chaos, while knights endeavor to sow seeds of hope amid the blood-stained ruins. But, my goddess, wielder of the sacred sword, the holy spear, and the divine grail, unleash your eternal fury. The hero cries out, his voice echoing with righteous anger. Destroy these fools who bask in their false triumph. Before them lies a ragged doll, a feeble symbol of the evil that has spread unchecked. Remember, Leon calls out to his knights, his voice resolute, as long as we hold fast to our honor, we are undefeated. The warriors listen intently to his impassioned speech, standing firm in their ranks. Goddess, my goddess, Leon beseeches, lifting his sword high. What must this humble knight do for you? With a fervent cry, the hero charges ahead of his troops atop a white steed, guided by the divine call. My knight, whispers the goddess, my cherished champion of righteousness. Tears stream down Leon's cheeks as he hears her voice. Your goddess shall stand by your side until the end, for the sake of honor, for the glory of Lionheart. The hero's voice resounds the kingdom's flag billowing in the wind. All units charge. Leon commands his countenance ablaze with fury. The winter, a season of finality, marks the culmination of a battle against billions of demons that have plagued the earth. It is a spectacle of grandeur, with vast hordes below and menacing winged beasts above. Barbarian slaves are pressed into service as living shields, while common citizens turn knights fight alongside their hereditary brethren chosen by the gods themselves. Leon, amidst the chaos, relentlessly hacks through the demonic ranks, each stroke a testament to his prowess as a holy knight. With unyielding determination, he cleaves through countless demon lords and archdemons, showcasing the indomitable power of righteousness. At 217 years old, the winter's chill fails to quell Leon's fervor as he continues to vanquish the evil spirits of every ilk. At 231, 234, and 256 years old, he remains undeterred, his tattered cloak a testament to his enduring resolve. Finally, at 256, Leon obliterates the last demon gate, leaving the malevolent beings with no escape. You vile, unholy servants of darkness, he roars his eyes ablaze with righteous fury. You're trapped in this world with me. I'll slay every last one of you. The evil spirits tremble in terror, realizing that in this forsaken realm, it is they who should fear, not the hero. And Leon shows no mercy, relentlessly cutting down his enemies, his every strike a rebuke to their wickedness. At 300 years old, amid the chaos of battle, a horned demon with fiery eyes collapses before a glowing white circle of energy beside the colossal corpse of a winged demon. A small group of onlookers gathers, their voices filled with awe and confusion. Are you alright? Someone inquires, seeking answers. 
The response comes swiftly. He defeated the archdemon with a single punch. A witness exclaims with excitement, gesturing towards the immense creature with rows of teeth, for horns, and a third eye adorning its forehead. Rise, brave souls. Leon commands, his visage streaked with blood, his gaze distant yet determined. Now is not the time for surrender. Stand and fight. The young men behind him gaze at Leon in astonishment, while a red-haired girl dares to ask, Who are you? I am King Lionheart, the hero declares, undeterred by his nakedness, but armed with a sword, standing proudly before the vanquished demon. I am a knight of the glorious knights and bearer of the will of the sacred temples. Though these words may seem strange, their meaning is clear to me. With conviction, he proclaims, I am Leon Draconia Lionheart, the protagonist unfazed by his nakedness. At 300 years old, the girl's astonishment is palpable as Leon encounters earthlings for the first time in his long life. And then, a status window appears. You have defeated all the demons. Demons left. Zero out of hundreds of millions. Victory is finally achieved. The Night King's return heralds chaos as a portal materializes in the heart of Seoul, labeled as undetectable black. The Korean Hunter Association and the World Hunter Association urge the largest guilds to join the raid, but their pleas are rebuffed due to the unknown difficulty category of the portal. Young hunters gaze upon the ominous gateway with a mix of surprise and fear. In a desperate move, the government orders the Korean Hunter Association to send representatives first, essentially turning them into unwitting suicide mission participants. Amidst the turmoil, a piece of the sky reveals a bloodied and enraged Leon, startling the onlookers. He's completely naked, the girl thinks, taken aback by the scene before her. Hari, calls out a familiar voice, drawing her attention. It's K.H. Hari, junior manager of the Korean Hunter Association, a red-haired girl with a band-aid on her cheek. She finally realizes someone is calling her. Nearby sits Kim jin Su, senior manager of the Korean Hunter Association, offering her a paper cup of coffee. Gratefully accepting it, Hari joins him as they sit in a typical law enforcement office, contemplating the unfolding nightmare and their role in confronting it. What's on your mind? Jinsu inquires, sensing Hari's distress. No one believes me, Hari confesses. I never doubted you, Jinsu reassures her. That was a demonic portal of the black category, and inside was nothing short of a colossal devil. To return from there alive without assistance from other guilds is nothing short of miraculous. And to single-handedly clean it up? Truly remarkable. Their conversation turns to the enigmatic figure seated nearby. Leon, resembling a deity with his naked form and sword in hand, now sits calmly, clad in a light sweater. Are you a survivor? Jinsu asks him, gesturing towards the portal. Hari interjects, yes, a survivor from another world, clarifying the concept for Jinsu. Leon regards them thoughtfully. Sometimes people manage to survive on worlds connected by portals, he explains. Similar gates began appearing on Earth about 30 years ago, each bearing ominous similarities. They left behind worlds in ruin or on the brink of destruction. Occasionally, survivors find their way back to Earth. As they converse, a knight emerges from a portal, escorted down the street by two law enforcement agents. These survivors possess incredible strength, honed in the demon realm. Governments worldwide spare no effort in meeting their needs, as evident in the two agents' diligent efforts to guide their charge. The survivors are under close surveillance, Hari voices her fear, her tone trembling with apprehension. We need to keep a close eye on him, she insists, her gaze troubled. Resting his head in his hand, Jin Su nods wearily. He understands the necessity of their vigilance. Even an S-class hunter risks death against a high-level demon, Jinsu remarks gravely, and this survivor dispatched the giant devil with a single blow, a creature that strikes fear even in the hearts of the most seasoned S-class hunters. A skull with sharp teeth and four horns serves as a chilling reminder of the formidable opponent Leon faced. But it's not just that he defeated it, Jinsu continues. A sword mark etched across the silhouette of the colossal devil emphasizes its immense size. 
He was exponentially stronger, he adds, noting Leon's impressive stature against his horned adversary. Despite the gravity of the situation, Leon's countenance remains serene. Most concerning, however, is the disparity in our cultures, the senior manager muses. By the title he bestowed upon himself, it's evident he held considerable influence, perhaps even as a king in his realm. Hari and Jinsu ride in the back seat of a car, the tension palpable. I believe everything will be all right, Hari offers optimistically. Why do you think that? Jinsu inquires. I can sense it in his voice, Hari responds, a hint of relief coloring her tone. I believe he's fundamentally a good person. Nasty brats. Leon bellows in a fit of rage, shattering the armored glass barrier behind him with a force that sends its shards hurtling toward the startled employees of the Hunter Association. Even monsters couldn't have shattered that glass. Hari shrieks in terror at the sudden display of fury. Seething with anger, Leon's fists clench, a yellowish glow emanating from behind him. How dare you besmirch the illustrious name of Lionheart, he exclaims indignantly. Quite the charmer, isn't he? Jinsu remarks dryly, observing the two bruised agents standing beside Leon, recalling Hari's earlier words about cultural differences. Perhaps it's just a matter of perspective, she suggests with a smile. Fifteen minutes earlier, a surveillance camera captures Leon sitting across from an interrogating agent at a desk. How peculiar this place is, he reflects sadly, reminiscing about his humble origins. It was meant to be, he realizes, pondering his past life as an orphan who toiled tirelessly until his untimely demise. I was reborn in another world, where I became a knight and eventually a king. It lasted for a century. Then I conquered the demon world, spending two centuries eradicating them. That's three centuries in total, so I'm fortunate to retain some memories of Earth. The scene shifts to the bald agent in black sunglasses addressing Leon. Hello, Leon Dragonia, Lionheart, he greets with a smile, papers spread out before him on the table. But perhaps it's best to conceal my past as an ordinary Earthman, the hero muses. He seems to be pondering something. Wouldn't it be preferable to be seen as a knight king who has lived for three centuries in another world, rather than a boy who perished from exhaustion at the age of twenty? Sir, address me as your majesty. Leon commands the agent, fixing him with a steely gaze. Though the agent responds with a disbelieving smile, beads of sweat betray his underlying tension. What? Oh, yes, your majesty, he stammers, rubbing the back of his head nervously. He's putting on an act, Leon realizes. Is he genuinely good-natured, or is he simply adhering to the prescribed protocol for survivors like myself? The hero finds himself grappling with a multitude of thoughts. Despite his hesitation, the agent manages to formulate his question. Regarding the Black Portal, or rather, Your Majesty's World, you made contact with our hunters and eradicated all the demons there, correct? Leon scrutinizes the agent carefully. Yes, he confirms. Or have you already forgotten? He adds pointedly, observing the agent's fearful reaction. I apologize, what do you mean? The agent inquires nervously. I vanquished every fiend and upheld the honor of the knights, Leon declares proudly. And I hereby appoint you as my temporary secretary, granting you the privilege of chronicling the tale of this glorious battle. The agent mumbles something unintelligible before finally acknowledging, ah, yes, the difference in cultures. He then proceeds to jot down notes on his papers. Sensing Leon's hunger, he quickly comprehends the unspoken request for food. Realizing Leon's query about Earth's customs, the agent swiftly pulls out his phone, enthusiastically announcing his intention to promptly order a meal. And please enlighten me about this world, Leon directs him, his thoughts turning to the need to catch up on Earth's developments since his departure. Of course, I'll provide an overview, the agent responds, adjusting his glasses. Adopting a serious tone, he begins, The nightmare commenced three decades ago, as portals began manifesting worldwide, unleashing monsters and demons onto Earth. His expression reflects the gravity of the situation as he alludes to a diverse array of menacing creatures. Since then, 
We've remained ever vigilant, enduring significant losses and recognizing each portal's distinct theme and purpose, the agent explains. Neglecting a portal inevitably leads to the emergence of dungeons, from which monsters flood onto the surface. I believe the food is ready, he informs Leon with a smile, rising from his seat. Reflecting on the agent's words, Leon strokes his chin thoughtfully. This differs somewhat from the events in my world, he realizes. There, demons proliferated indiscriminately, whereas here, portals bear specific themes and purposes. With a contemplative gaze, the hero gazes into the distance, pondering the implications of this revelation. It appears, Leon ruminates, as if someone is conducting a form of training through various trials. Before him stands an imposing figure wielding a massive hammer, poised to strike the ground. Interrupting his thoughts, a voice echoes from behind the cracked door. The meal is served, your majesty. The agent announces cheerfully, entering with a tray of plates in hand. Examining the dish before him, Leon's bloodshot eyes widen. It's solanine, a delicacy consisting of ox leg slow-cooked for 10 hours, seasoned with salt, pepper, and crunchy kimchi. As a simple laborer on earth, he had relished this dish. However, a surge of apprehension fills his mouth with saliva as he realizes he cannot bring himself to partake in it. Why the somber expression? He questions the agent who brought the meal. It's called Solon, your majesty, the agent responds. This dish is renowned as a favorite among peasants. Rage ignites within Leon's eyes. Wretched peasants, he bellows furiously, slamming his hand onto the table. How dare you tarnish the illustrious name of Lionheart? How dare you serve a peasant dish to your king? Is this how your kingdom regards other monarchs? The agent recoils in terror, shielding himself with the tray, as if expecting a physical assault. Leon Draconia Lionheart, king of another realm, mediator of the gods, protector of the Holy Grail, wielder of the holy sword and spear, towers over him. Despite the agent's attempts to justify himself, Leon dismisses him with disdain, branding him a lowly slave. The overturned dish of Solanine lies on the floor, its contents spilled. As the malice lord of chaos and leader of the 23 great devils, sworn enemy of the demons who decimated millions, and the returned one who once lived as an earthman, Leon's return after 300 years unveils a world in disarray, lacking true religious faith. His expression contorts with pure, unbridled rage. Educating these dark serfs, he resolves, is the responsibility of the royal family. Though back on earth, Leon remains the Night King. Amidst the chaos, he delicately cuts into a succulent steak, savoring each bite. Han Hari, observing him, remarks on his enjoyment of the T-bone steak and vintage red wine from 1993. Hari, you go first, they instruct her. I don't know the old ways of speaking, the girl protests indignantly. But I think he'll still prefer to converse with you, Kim Jinsu remarks, standing beside her with crossed arms. He complimented you and acknowledged your bravery. And at least he didn't kick you out. Hari finds herself unable to counter these persuasive arguments. But is that sufficient? She silently pleads with me not to send her in there, your majesty. With trepidation, Hari timidly pushes the door open and peers inside. I apologize deeply for intruding upon your meal. Leon wipes his lips with a towel. I recognize you, he states. You're a swordsman. I've seen you before. Please, have a seat. He orders, eliciting a happy smile from Hari. Behind her back, she discreetly gives a thumbs-up signal, visible to her companions observing the scene on their monitors. Did you enjoy your meal, Hari? Leon inquires hopefully. It was acceptable the hero replies. I could sense the sincerity and skill of the chef who prepared it. However, my discontent earlier wasn't solely due to the modest fare, he adds, crossing his arms. It was your treatment of the king that displeased me. When facing the ruler of a foreign land, one must extend proper respect. It only serves to enhance your authority. An apologetic smile graces Hurry's face. Excuse me, she says, I realize I haven't shown you the proper respect due to my ignorance. It's all right, Leon reassures her. Your name is Han, right? 
Yes, I'm Han Hari, the girl responds, settling across from Leon and curling into a ball, perhaps out of shyness or fear. I've heard about this world, the hero remarks. Demons, these unholy creatures, have appeared on earth, haven't they? He fixes her with a stern look. Yes, they have, Hari confirms, her hands folded humbly on her lap. Her sole objective now is to persuade the survivor to join the Hunter Association. The coat of arms of this organization is displayed. I must enlist his service for our country, Han Hari thinks. Perhaps, with your majesty's consent, the South Korean government could provide for him from now on, she adds sadly. In the 21st century, the primary focus of intelligence services has been locating survivors and recruiting them to their cause. The costs were not considered. Every effort was made to prevent these unique individuals from aligning with other nations. Leon ponders this. So, while I'm in this world, he says, crossing his arms over his chest, I must fight on the battlefields. If I'm to be an honorable knight, that's my duty. This means you agree to form an alliance with our hunter association. Hari exclaims joyfully, her eyes brimming with hope. But a king can't serve as a soldier in another nation's army. Leon retorts angrily. I will establish a new order of knights in this world. Han Hari winces at his words, unsure how to respond. The camera captures the unfolding scene. Hari can only nod. What did the superiors say? She asks anxiously as she enters the office where Kim Jinsu awaits. Her partner soothes her nerves. What could they say? He reassures her. They usually acquiesce to any demands. They couldn't permit him to leave for another country or join a larger guild. Just imagine, Hari adds wearily and with disdain. An organization mandated by the government forced to bow before such individuals. All because of the scoundrels from the major guilds who flaunt their wealth and power. She observes the girl clenching her fists in frustration. Now that you mention it, Jean Su interjects, the Phoenix Guild. A shrill alarm suddenly blares in the office. Kim Jinsu retrieves her phone and reads an urgent message on the screen. Attention! Breakthrough at the Han on Plains Dungeon. Potential disruption in the Granary area, Jinsu reports, scanning her mobile device. It appears that S-Class Hunter Lee Youngwing is affiliated with the Phoenix Guild. Hang! Hari turns to her partner. He can easily handle the orange portal. It's clear who she's referring to. Apparently, this is a notorious villain. I'm certain those scoundrels have a different agenda, Jean Su responds angrily. We need to head there immediately and address the situation. Outside the door, Leon overhears curses directed at the Phoenix Guild. The hero pieces together the situation from what he's heard. I believe they're facing trouble, he thinks, glancing towards the door. If there's a breach, the land will remain contaminated and nothing will grow for a long time. His hand begins to emit a glowing energy. Just as I suspected, he realizes, this world lacks it. Streams of energy rise, swirling around Leon. Are you alright? He inquires, amidst the intense bluish lights. Demra, Leon utters. Before them stands a magnificent palace with towering spires. A girl with a green cape covering her head smiles. A few ears of wheat, emitting sparks, fall onto the field where they grow. An orange portal looms behind her. Hunter Lee Young Ong Wong. What's happening here? A red-haired young man with an insolent expression confronts them. It's the same Lee Young Ong Wong, guild master of Phoenix, an S-class hunter. What, are you from the association? The individual responds, recognizing his interlocutors. Oh, it's you, department head Kim, and the new recruit, too? What a despicable person. Jin Su thinks to himself, he deliberately allowed a breach to occur. They're retaliating because we denied their request. The Phoenix Guild has long sought exemption from portal income taxes. They rake in considerable profits from the worlds they access, selling magic crystals and weapons crafted from monsters, for example. And now they're demanding a one trillion tax deduction. Phoenix is already a wealthy major guild. Kim Jin Su muses with a furrowed brow. But who would have thought they'd resort to outright sabotage when denied their preferences? Hunter Lee Yang Wong, Hari asserts firmly. We need to seal this portal immediately. 
It's been open all week. If we leave it like this? I understand, I understand, Ng replies with a malicious grin. The portal rights we've obtained will transfer to the other party. But what can I do? He asks, feigning helplessness. Our guild members are severely injured. They're in no condition to embark on a raid. We'll attempt to close it by tomorrow, but there's no guarantee of success. Don't you have an ounce of patriotism? Hari shouts furiously at the Phoenix Guild hunters, her anger palpable. Kim jin Su places a reassuring hand on her shoulder, attempting to calm her down. You know exactly what will happen if the Hanum planes become infected, she shouts. Don't I know that? Li Young responds with a mixture of anger and smugness. What kind of childish display is this, Miss Hari? I warned you of the consequences at last year's meeting, didn't I? The girl pauses, casting a wide-eyed glance at Yang Ong Wong. In this world, justice is dictated by money and power, interjects Leon, the hero. His majesty turns as the Night King approaches from behind, recognizing him with surprise. Speak the king's name with due respect, admonishes the hero. I only allowed you to address me by my title, woman. Who are you? Leona Yingang retorts sarcastically. You seem like an outsider. Silence. The hero cuts him off abruptly. How can such a nobody dare to speak at all? He glares at the hunter with fury and contempt. What's wrong with this fool? Yang Ong Wing wonders, and used to such disrespect. Gritting his teeth in anger, he retorts, He dares to insult me. One of the 20 S-class hunters in the world and a guild master of one of the top 10 guilds. Do you wish to meet your end? His hand begins to emit a glowing energy. Hunter Li Yang Ong, please, stop. Hari pleads desperately. He's a survivor, just like us. Yang Ong gazes at the hero in disbelief. I apologize for my earlier rudeness, he says to Leon, placing a hand over his heart and bowing humbly. I'm Li Yang Ong Wong of the Phoenix Guild. You might be from the GRY Guild. The king's words are final, Leon asserts, casting a sidelong glance at the hunter. Now, tell me what the issue is, he says to Jin Su. I'm not familiar with the portal situation, so please give me a brief overview. Yang, now ignored by everyone, seethes with anger. He's actually going to assist us, Jin Su thinks incredulously. Hari beams with delight, clapping her hands. We've encountered a dungeon breakthrough, she begins. During such events, a multitude of demons and monsters spill into a specific territory, rendering the land barren thereafter. Before them lies a field strewn with wilted ears of corn. The Hanum Plains serve as a vital breadbasket, making their protection crucial. As Leon strides across the field, Hari and Jinsu trail behind him. The demonic energy is spreading, infecting the earth. The girl continues her explanation. What's the solution? The hero inquires. We must eradicate the pollution and clear the dungeon swiftly, Hari declares. And the dungeon itself must be completely eradicated. I understand, says Leon, his leg visible against the backdrop of corn stalks. The issue of the earth's contamination and the expanding portal needs to be addressed. Gather your forces, he commands. The girl regards him with a puzzled expression. Tomorrow, when the raid time limit expires, the king will personally step into this red circle, Leon cryptically announces. All eyes turn towards the portal, which appears to be growing in size. However, Hari, not willing to believe her luck, interjects, but there's a hurdle, says Leon. The king of a foreign nation cannot engage in military activities on foreign soil without proper authorization. His tone is grave. I need approval from the king of this realm. What? Hari asks, perplexed. Surely he won't object. There are protocols and legal procedures for such matters, she insists. But Leon remains resolute. I cannot claim to be an honorable knight if I disregard your nation's laws. Send word to your king swiftly. Li Yangong regards Leon with astonishment. This guy might be even more uncompromising than I am, he muses. Eventually, the South Korean president is reached via phone, despite being aboard a plane. Your Majesty, Hari addresses the hero, ensuring his attention. All preparations have been completed. But how do you intend to utilize it? 
Hari gestures towards the straw doll she holds. Your land is precious, but it's contaminated, Leon responds. We must cleanse it. Forget about the straw doll, he says frankly, leaving Hari bewildered by the turn of events. Leon made two demands. One of them involved the straw doll. Were these dolls crafted by women? He questions Hari, his gaze sternly directed towards someone. The girl confirms this. The second requirement was that the dolls must be made by women who have given birth. Before them stand several dozen representatives of the female population. Very well, the hero addresses them. Present the dolls you've crafted. The impromptu puppet show takes place in the heart of the plains. Leon regards the straw doll in the hands of a black-haired young woman with skepticism. Impossible, he declares. What do you mean it's impossible to consider this metaphysical eccentricity a doll? She protests. Leon tears the toy apart. Marriage? What nonsense. A doll with a rooster's head was dismissed because of marriage. Did you truly give birth? Leon's fury is evident. Idiot. Fool. Marriage? From Kim Jinsu, the hero rejects numerous homemade toys. Only an 89-year-old married woman catches his attention. Incredible, remarks the hero, eyeing a small, adorable doll adorned in a green dress. How many children have you birthed? He inquires of the woman. Twelve, she replies. This is a true patriot, Leon acknowledges, affectionately taking her hand in his own. In my kingdom, I would personally knight you and bestow upon you medals and gifts, but my authority is limited here, so please accept my apologies. With pride and joy radiating from her, he kisses the hand of the elderly woman. Leon now cradles a whimsical doll dressed in a green gown. The toy rests upon a small table amidst the wheat field, illuminated by a flickering candle. All conditions have been fulfilled, declares Leon. He extends his hand, revealing a blue magic circle adorning his wrist. Suddenly, a goblet adorned with precious stones materializes in the hero's grasp. Mother of this bountiful land, Leon murmurs softly as he holds the goblet aloft. The people of this land offer you this harvest. All eyes, including those of Li Yangong Wang, are fixed on the unfolding ritual, disbelief evident in their expressions. Please accept it, the hero implores. A radiant beam of yellow light emits from the goblet as water begins to fill the vessel, rising to its brim. The beam vanishes as swiftly as it appears. Hari watches in astonishment, having just witnessed dishes inexplicably filling with water moments before. As the sun begins its ascent, its rays illuminate the glass goblet, causing the water within to sparkle. The clouds blush with hues of red as droplets of water cascade from the goblet onto the table below. A new day dawns. Leon closes his eyes in tranquility, but the dawn that awaits today. Before them, drops of water glisten in the sun's rays, trickling towards the whimsical doll dressed in green. We shall bestow a special beginning upon this world. Behold, the water is taking shape into a doll. Le DWI's voice echoes loudly, tinged with fear as he observes the phenomenon unfolding before him. Look, the doll is stirring on its own. It appears to be coming to life, he exclaims. I offer my greetings to you, Mother Earth, Leon says, bowing his head respectfully. Imra, goddess of life and abundance, it has been a while since our last encounter. The animated doll stands beside the goblet, bathed in the rays of the newly risen sun, embodying the deity's presence on Earth. Salutations, great Mother Earth, Leon addresses the doll, while the phoenix hunters gaze at him in disbelief. Dear Demra, divine guardian of life and fertility, the animated toy in the green dress begins to speak. This new land has also fallen victim to evil. The earth is tainted. Yes, there are malevolent entities here as well, Leon acknowledges, but there is no divine presence. So I fear the vial will only see you as prey. Luing realizes the implication and opens his mouth in protest. Ignorance and greed are not always sins. Demra interjects. They are inherent traits of mortals. What is your plan now? She asks the hero. He gazes at her, hand resting on his chest, and remains silent for a moment. 
It's easy to lose oneself amidst the warriors, he finally responds. But the power of conquest stems from the divine. I will ensure that the people here understand the true meaning of duty and power. I will educate the ignorant and guide them towards the righteous path, Leon declares with determination evident in his eyes, signaling his firm resolve to fulfill his grand promises. Until a new pantheon arises on this earth, he concludes, eliciting a pleased expression from the doll's face. Child, perhaps you have a question for me? The doll offers, extending a finger. We are always ready. Leon kneels before her, seeing not a doll, but a genuine goddess adorned in a green dress with magnificent wings. Dear Demra, he begins, the free citizens of this earth suffer under the influence of evil energies. I know this is not your desire, but please, heal and cleanse this land. You are the leader of my temple, our champion, he implores, the doll glowing with joy. The earth of this world is not my body, Demra replies solemnly. A drop of water falls from her finger. I shall extend my divinity here and replenish this parched land with my essence. Another drop of water traverses the desiccated ears of corn and descends to the ground. Then all that treads upon this earth shall be your allies, Demra assures. Water cascades across the arid terrain, and from this sight, a radiant beam of golden energy ascends into the sky. The ears of corn begin to stir with life. Witnesses of this miraculous event gaze in awe, their mouths agape at the spectacle unfolding before them. Observe and learn. Leon bellows angrily as he turns to face them. You disregard the teachings of those who cannot learn and remain ignorant. This world is blessed with divine presence, he proclaims solemnly. Before them lies a field aglow with golden energy. To birth and flourish, the hero declares, this is the true purpose of all living beings. Hari gasps, her hand covering her mouth in shock, while Jinsu struggles to comprehend the unfolding spectacle. This fertile soil, Leon announces, striking a dramatic pose before the table adorned with the animated doll, serves as a testament to an eternal covenant. Li Yangong, visibly annoyed and enraged, holds a handful of ears of corn, with the radiant field behind him continuing to shimmer in gold. He addresses the hunters standing before him, who are also assessing the quality of the crops. Don't be deceived, he admonishes. Crops cultivated with magic are toxic. You must know this. Liam casts a disdainful glance over his shoulder at Yangong. This harvest is divinely blessed, he retorts. How dare you label it poison? That blasted doll. Yangong begins to protest, but Leon swiftly intervenes. I can forgive ignorance once, he states, fixing a stern gaze upon the hunter. But do not tarnish the divine with your foul tongue. Yangong seethes with anger, yet fear also flickers across his face. This can't be happening, he thinks. All my schemes will unravel because of this aberration. His subordinates gaze at him with confusion, awaiting orders. I cannot allow this to continue, Yang Ong Wing realizes, his teeth clenched in frustration. We must expose his shameless deceit. We need to verify everything. The determined hunter squares his shoulders, fists clenched tightly. I expect your cooperation, he informs the hero, for the sake of those who will consume it all. I will expose him as a fraud, he resolves inwardly. I'll deploy my own appraiser, Yang Ong declares his demeanor easing slightly as he points to a young man bearing a resemblance to himself. Then let's begin, the specialist announces, extending his hand as a stream of bluish energy emanates from it. The appraiser appears wary, sensing something amiss. A window materializes before them. Blessed rice, category, rare, description. Rice imbued with the divine essence of Demra, the goddess of life and fertility. Regular consumption of this rice in meals aids in the treatment of third category diseases, rare category. The rice is all rare, the appraiser exclaims, the light still radiating from his hand. It cures third category diseases, even cancer. Hari and Jinsu approach the specialist again, incredulous at his words. He confirms their suspicions. 
Leon and Demra regard the humans in silence, the former composed, the latter brimming with joy. Fedjapot. Kim vin sukomans. Nearby, rice cooker and firewood await in readiness at the edge of the rice field. This is unbelievable. Jinsu ruminates as he consumes the rice from the cup. Before him, another informational plaque reveals that the rice is derived from the blessed rice plant. Attributes. Stamina recovery rate increases by 100 per minute. Mana recovery rate increases by 50 per minute, with an effect duration of 8 hours. It's essentially an enhancer, Kim Jinsu concludes. How can mere rice possess the potency of a booster worth 3 million won per bottle? Hari interjects from behind. Excitement is evident in her voice. Manager, she addresses him, locking eyes with him. We have some crucial news. Finish chewing before speaking, the young man reprimands her. Quickly finishing her mouthful, the girl continues. I was curious, so I ingested a grasshopper. The senior manager's incredulity resurfaces as if he misheard. And I gained a buff. Hari exclaims enthusiastically. Jinsu struggles to comprehend what he's hearing. If this blessing extends to everything around us, he ponders, then it wouldn't be surprising if all living beings were similarly blessed. Across the field, hunters disperse, capturing insects with their hands and nets. Catch as many as you can, they hear the directive. We'll head to the portal armed with a bounty of buffs. The motivation of the Hunter Association's Raider Squad surges. Child, Demra addresses Leon, who turns to her. Yes, dear goddess Demra, I'm all ears, he responds. I feel my purpose here has been fulfilled, the doll remarks, standing beside the goblet and candle on the table amidst the field. It's time for me to return. Leon kneels before her, hand over his chest. I will never forget the divine love you bestowed upon us, he says earnestly. Child, allow me to impart one last piece of advice, the animated doll requests. The hero closes his eyes, prepared to receive her wisdom. Remember to nourish yourself, she advises. Before them stands a resplendent goddess inhabiting a simple ragdoll, now departing. The lifeless figure, clad in a green dress, remains on the table beside the candle. Your Majesty, Leon timidly inquires, Hari, what was that divine power? There are no gods in this world, she replies. Now it's the hero's turn to seek answers. I do not know, Hari responds uncertainly. The right life in the right world requires divine guidance, Leon asserts. It would be wise for the inhabitants of this land to remember this. Now that our troops are replenished, we shall proceed to the portal, he announces and his destination becomes clear. Guildmaster, one of his subordinates addresses Li Wang. What's happening? Is this normal? It appears our plan is jeopardized. It's all because of that surviving scoundrel, the hunter retorts angrily. Where did he even come from? Yang Ong wonders to himself. If it weren't for him, the government would have had to concede to our demands. I wish for him to perish within this portal, Leon declares, leading a squad of a dozen association hunters as they advance towards the gateway to another world. Seemingly struck by an idea, Yang Ong smiles and strokes his chin thoughtfully. It's not a bad notion, he muses aloud. One of his associates queries what he means precisely. Fear not, the guild master responds. This portal has already been partially explored. His comrade concurs. Indeed, he confirms. It's somewhat intricate in the center, but the assistant seems to grasp everything. There's only one A-class hunter in their squad, Yang Ong boasts. This Kuri, the surviving scoundrel, likely possesses a blessing focus buff. I wager it's utterly ineffectual in real combat. Thus, they're all doomed to perish. A sinister grin stretches across the scoundrel's face from ear to ear. Inside the portal looms something dreadfully ominous and indescribable a monstrous entity impervious to conventional means. A crimson warning signal flashes. The dungeon breakout commences. Death looms, with a countdown issued for all inhabitants within. The portal before us manifests as a cave, its exit visible in the distance. A man's footsteps echo within. They belong to Leon, unarmed yet flanked by a dozen armed hunters. 
Kim Jin Su leads the squad while the hero assumes the rear guard. In essence, Leon muses, most portals will close upon clearing or defeating the boss. I relish the prospect of dueling with bosses. What Hari hadn't yet divulged was that her guild's hunters typically overwhelmed leaders with a coordinated assault from all angles. The hero gazes thoughtfully at a skeleton strewn across the cave floor. I've been informed that this is a previously cleared dungeon, but it seems there are far more monsters than anticipated. The skeleton's gaze shifts towards the cave ceiling. Ah, that's a characteristic of this dungeon, comes the reply. A defining trait. Indeed, Hari concurs. In most portals, the monster count diminishes as they're exterminated. However, with skeletons, zombies, and sometimes demons, if the boss remains alive, the monsters are incessantly revived. Fascinating, Leon remarks, arms folded across his chest. So this is one of those dungeons? She affirms, most likely yes. Glancing at the red warning window, she adds, it's probable that the skeletons here are under the control of a necromancer, or so I believe. As the dungeon breakout commences, new intel reveals that Knight Danahan is advancing on the hunters with his army, necessitating the defeat of the Dalahan Knight. The association's hunter squad finds itself under assault by some form of energy attack, inducing fear among them. Some clutch their heads in agony, while others collapse to their knees. Li Yingang Wang, the Undersungers, spews vitriol at Kim Jin Su, blaming him for failing to forewarn them of the impending threat. Leon and Hari survey the enemy, a fearsome monster with blazing eyes and numerous sharp horns, accompanied by a necromancer astride a towering horse, confronts them. Before them looms a massive army of skeletons, their empty eye sockets emitting an eerie blue glow. A warning window indicates that there are 2 hours and 58 minutes remaining to defeat Knight Dalham. The skeletons advance, unsettling the hunters who chatter nervously. Sir, should I distribute the potions? One asks Jin Su. Yes, but prioritize those in the front ranks, he instructs. Mashik, he calls to one of the fighters. How many archers and mages do they have? Drawing his bowstring taut, Mashik reports seeing 30 archers and two magicians. Jinsu directs hunters with sniper skills to eliminate long-range enemies, while those with shields are tasked with halting the skeleton army's advance. Clad in a shield, he positions himself at the forefront of his squad. Come on, you bastards attack! Jinsu's voice echoes as the skeletons rush toward him, eagerly accepting the invitation. With their swords poised high, they descend upon the hunting party. Jinsu braces against their onslaught with his towering shield. They're stronger than I expected, he muses. Seems the orange portals differ from the rest. Swinging a massive hammer, he dispatches opponents with unique shapes, but Jinsu realizes these skeletons pose a greater threat than anticipated. Damn it, he curses inwardly. Their spells are too sophisticated for mere skeletons. Two skeletal magicians begin drawing intricate magic circles around themselves. I need to draw their attention, Jin Su strategizes. Come on, come on. His shouts seem effective as one of the skeleton mages turns its gaze towards him, launching a bluish charge in his direction, leaving a vivid streak in the air. Concerned voices inquire about Jin Su's well-being. He reassures them, likening the attack to a mere beast sting a testament to his top-tier equipment. Before him, atop a colossal horse, sits the leader of the skeletons, Danahan, a truly intimidating figure under the command of the necromancer. Jinsu braces himself for the impending challenge, knowing it won't be easy. Danahan swiftly delivers a powerful blow, causing Jinsu to drop his hammer and shield, forcing him to sit and gather his strength on the ground. Hari notices Jinsu's plight, and tries to call out to him for support. Meanwhile, Leon remains passive, observing the scene alongside the girl, seemingly detached from the unfolding events. A young hunter implores Hari to intervene and save Jinsu, suggesting it might be time to deploy the reserves. Hari acknowledges the urgency, recognizing that reserves are meant for such critical moments, especially with the necromancer's aggressive stance. Hari, armed with a formidable sword and remarkable speed, moves decisively, 
though some hunters find his abilities perplexing. Hari decides to seek assistance from King Lionheart, renowned for his prowess in vanquishing formidable foes with a single strike. My lord, she implores, please lend us your aid. Tearfully, she looks to Leon, hoping for his support. However, Leon remains stoic, displaying no emotion as he rejects the plea, deeming the battle beneath a king's dignity. It is beneath a king to involve himself in such trivial skirmishes, he asserts. Hari, taken aback by his callous response, demands clarification. Seek your own path to glory, the hero declares with grandiosity. I refuse to degrade myself by pulverizing these insignificant minions. It's an affront to the goddess. I can't bear to witness it any longer. Hari is baffled by his words. What in the world is he talking about? She wonders. The girl standing behind Hari, shocked, asks what their squad's role should be. I can't afford to waste any more time, Hari realizes. This man has no intention of aiding them today. He's solely focused on Dallin, she realizes, glancing at Leon. Meanwhile, the hero diligently observes the necromancer's movements, trying to decipher his speed. We must neutralize Danahan, Hari decides. I'll handle the boss she instructs her team. The rest of you, assist and protect Kim Jinsu and our allies. Grabbing a sword, Hari swiftly charges into battle. She spots her target, Dallin, towering behind several rows of skeletons shielding him. Dodging past the monsters, Hari leaps into the air and delivers a swift strike with her sword upon reaching the necromancer. Hunters positioned farther away from Danahan witness a brilliant orange flash. A closer look reveals Hari's blade clashing against Danahan's massive sword. He blocked the attack, she realizes, her expression morphing into a mix of anger and frustration. I need to isolate the necromancer from his undead horde, Hari realizes. What on earth is this? She thinks as she spots Danahan's glowing eyes before her. Examining the boss's torso, she notices that his head has detached and gained a life of its own. This is bewildering, she thinks. Did he toss his head to obstruct my view? What kind of trickery is this? It appears the undead possess their own cunning. Dallin's head is noticeably displaced, emitting an ominous energy clot. Hari strikes again, feeling a resistance as if hitting a solid object. Thank goodness, she thinks upon landing from her jump. Yet, to her surprise, the necromancer remains unharmed raising his sword menacingly over her. Nonetheless, she has successfully severed Dallin from his skeletal army. Apologies, she addresses the rearing necromancer. My reach was broader than anticipated. She readies her sword for another strike. A powerful glow fills the cave as her blow connects. Got it, Hari thinks, feeling confident that she has landed a decisive hit. With determination, she scrutinizes the situation hoping it's enough to vanquish him. As she ponders, another unexpected turn of events unfolds. The girl's eyes widen in astonishment as she gazes at her adversary. Did he manage to deflect her strike with the flat of his sword? Unbelievable, she muses, begrudgingly acknowledging her opponent's combat prowess. She regards him with a newfound sense of respect. In retaliation, Dallin strikes back forcing Hari to exert herself to evade his attack. It's remarkable. Suddenly, a voice breaks through the fray, applauding the necromancer's skill. What exquisite swordsmanship, wielding with such finesse and precision, all with one hand. Surely, you were once a gallant knight. The voice praises the necromancer. Allow me to extend my sincerest apologies. It appears I mistook a distinguished knight for a mere undead. To the unknown knight, he addresses the necromancer, I, the king of Lionheart, bestow upon you the honor of challenging me. Hari, still on all fours before Danahan, stares at Leon in disbelief, struggling to comprehend the situation. Why? She thinks, perplexed. There's no need to soil the hands of ordinary warriors, the hero declares to the skeleton leader. I propose we settle this conflict through a noble duel between two knights. He then fixes a determined gaze upon the necromancer. He's challenged the boss to a duel. It finally dawns on Hari. 
Jin Su, now recovered shares in her disbelief. Even the mindless skeletons are stunned. This is simply inconceivable, they all think. With his head still detached, the necromancer appears to contemplate the situation before ultimately consenting.